This is Joachim from Sabaton, and I'm Lawrence of Arabia. And this is Sabaton History. Now, you may have noticed that this is not our regular studio. We are, in fact, standing in the Sahara Desert because we're filming the video for the Sabaton song, Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Which, of course, is the title of the book that Lawrence wrote. He did. Let's learn all about it. Yes, do it. The Great War, late 1915. British High Command frustrated about the war's progress. Not only was the Western Front as bloody and immobile as ever, the attacks at Gallipoli had yet to bear any fruit, and the success of the Kut Alamara expedition in Mesopotamia was uncertain. The need to open yet another front seemed pressing to many, but forces were spread thin, with really the last available contingent sent to Egypt to safeguard the Suez Canal, which the Ottomans had attacked earlier in the year. But in Cairo, a new opportunity arose as the Sharif of Mecca, Hussein bin Ali of the Hashemites, offered the British a deal. The Sharif dreamed of building an independent Islamic caliphate, and in exchange for assistance in terms of money, guns, and supplies, would call upon the Arabs to revolt against Ottoman rule. The British chief of intelligence there, Gilbert Clayton, was intrigued. An Arab force running wild in the Ottomans' rear, disrupting the stability of the empire from within, was quite a proposal. Though an independent Arab state on the Arabian Peninsula and in the north from Syria to Mesopotamia, as the Sharif envisioned, was absolutely not in the Entente's interest. Well, negotiations dragged on until March 1916, when Clayton succeeded in drawing in the Arabs without making concrete concessions. Instead, British High Command let the Arabs think that they would get a triumphant entry into the holy sites and would even take Damascus. An Arab army would be created accompanied by carefully chosen British officers. One such man was Thomas Edward Lawrence. As a young man, Lawrence had been charmed by Charles Montague Doty's travels in Arabia Deserta and chose to study what was then called Orientalism, but which was Middle Eastern studies and the Arabic language. Now, he was not an imposing figure, standing only 165 tall. That's five foot five, to those of you who don't do meters. But he compensated with intelligence, passion, and a fair amount of showmanship. He was assigned to the British officer corps in Egypt, spending most of his time collecting the necessary maps about the Near East and supervising the decoding of telegrams between Gallipoli and Cairo. Lawrence's expertise in the cultural, geographical, religious characteristics of the region made him an ideal candidate for this new mission. By June 1916, Lawrence and a group of British officers were on their way to support the Arab revolt that had been proclaimed by Faisal, the son of the Sharif of Mecca. In and around Mecca, the rebels had already overwhelmed the small Ottoman garrisons. However, the Great Revolution had failed to materialize. There were some intellectual circles in the big cities who supported the idea of an independent Arab state, but the bulk of the population had remained pro-Ottoman. The deliberate revolutionary conflagration did not materialize. Ottoman soldiers were not deserting in droves to the Sharif as hoped. Faisal welcomed Lawrence into his camp, though, and had him dressed in Arab clothes. This was an important gesture. Wearing the looser Arab dress instead of the tight British uniform, he visibly became part of the Arab culture and slowly gained the trust of the other tribesmen. Lawrence slipped into his Arab skin, as he called it, and could freely move in and out of Faisal's tent. While the British High Command judged the value of the Arab revolt purely by the numbers of rebels, or the amounts of rifles, cannons, and gold they had to supply them with, Lawrence began to understand the Arab struggle and their desire to live freely according to their religion and their customs, as he spent weeks on end traveling with them through the desert. The more he came to know them, the less he supported the British Empire for its arrogance towards lesser civilizations and its ignorance of the Arab world. On the other hand, though, Lawrence knew very well he could never fully become one of them. He could make the tribesmen respect him, or even befriend him, but he would still forever be an infidel to them. He felt uh, that a shadow of loneliness and contempt for the world was creeping over him. More and more, he felt like he was playing a role, an actor on the world stage, moving from one civilization to the other. Sometimes he was a British officer leading the Arab revolt, revolver in hand. 
and then sometimes he was a traveler in Arab clothing, riding for days on end through the desert on camelback. By the end of 1916, Faisal's host had been pretty much constantly on the run from the Ottoman army. The Bedouin were tough and fearsome warriors, sure, but totally unaccustomed to the tactics of modern war. They were not willing to dig trenches, and even if they were persuaded to dig them, they refused to get into them. They wanted a mobile fight, as they had had for generations, attacking quickly and in a fury. And if things didn't go their way or they were outgunned, they retreated and evaded their enemies. And Lawrence had to accept that he could not turn the Bedouin into modern soldiers. Although courageous, they were easily spooked by artillery fire, and the sight of a single airplane could throw them into disarray. They could be trained to work machine guns and handle explosives easily enough, but would not parade like European armies, nor could they be drilled and ordered around. So Lawrence had to work differently with them. Once more, the British financed an army for Faisal, recruiting thousands of eager warriors from the local tribes. They made for the city of Wag and overwhelmed the surprised Ottoman garrison, slaughtering the defeated troops and plundering everything of value. In fact, the Bedouin leaders refused to carry on until they had finished celebrating. It was custom. Nowhere else was it more obvious how modernity clashed with old traditions. So through the long desert rides in an environment totally unknown to most of his people at home, Lawrence tried to figure out how to maximize the strength of Bedouin warfare. They avoided the main Ottoman units and instead waited in ambush for smaller reserve units or supply columns. In guerrilla fashion, they raided minor camps and attacked telegraph stations and were more of a nuisance than a real threat to the empire. That is, until they set their sights on a major lifeline of the empire, the Hejaz Railway that ran between Damascus and Medina. Lawrence led the ambushes, laying mines and explosives on the railway line. Then, at the crucial moment, as the mines exploded and the locomotive derailed, he let the Arabs loose. Supported by Lewis machine guns, the Arabs first shot the carriages to pieces and then stormed the wreckage with scimitars and daggers, killing the survivors. The Arabs were fighting like devils, the sweat blurring their eyes, dust parching their throats, while the flame of cruelty and revenge which was burning in their bodies so twisted them that their hands could hardly shoot. By my order, we took no prisoners for the only time in our war. By the end of 1917, the British had pumped nearly two million pounds worth of gold into the saddlebags of the Sharif and his sons. And not without reason was Lawrence called the man with the gold. And the constant losses on the Hejaz Railway and the British offensives in Palestine had put steady pressure on the Ottoman forces, allowing the Arabs to move more freely. The capture of Aqaba solidified Lawrence's reputation as a Bedouin leader, and more and more Arabs began joining his host, even as Ottoman protection money was drying up. By September 1918, the Palestine Front finally collapsed under the weight of the British offensives. The Ottoman army was in full retreat and chaos raged from Palestine to Syria. Most of the Holy Land fell under British control and together with Lawrence's Bedouins, they pursued the disorganized Ottomans. But this phase of the fight showed another side of the guerrilla war that was not just romantic camel rides in the desert. The brutality of the Arabs was well known, but it became so problematic that British officers even sometimes allowed their prisoners to keep their guns to defend themselves against the Bedouins. And as the Allied forces moved on Damascus, it also became clear that the British had no intention of allowing the Arabs their own independent caliphate. Instead, the Middle East should be split up in spheres of influence among the British and French as soon as the Ottomans had lost control over it. The economic and geostrategic importance of the region were too important after all. They had signed the Sykes-Picot secret agreement already in 1916, with the lands carved up by lines just drawn on a map with no regard for tribal or religious boundaries, an agreement which bears a fair amount of blame for a hundred years of Middle Eastern strife. Lawrence found himself confronted with events moving beyond his control. As the Great War ended, Arab independence seemed to be further away than ever, and he, soon a hero to the British public, felt like a traitor. He published his experiences in his book, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. The cabinet raised the Arabs to fight for us by definite promises of self-government afterwards. Arabs believe in person, 
not in institutions. They saw in me a free agent of the British government and demanded from me an endorsement of its written promises. So I had to join the conspiracy and, from what my word was worth, assured the men of their reward. In our two years partnership under fire, they grew accustomed to believing me and to think my government, like myself, sincere. In this hope, they performed some fine things. But of course, instead of being proud of what we did together, I was bitterly ashamed. T.E. Lawrence would soon become the legend Lawrence of Arabia, a modern Robin Hood to the British public. His tale was a tale of courageous fighting, of distant journeys and exotic oriental adventure. Although it is often hard to tell what truly happened and what was Lawrence's exaggeration and dramatization, and that is still debated by historians today, his legendary status is unquestionable. And like the Red Barons, it has lived on for a hundred years after the Great War. Now, did you ever actually read Seven Pillars of Wisdom? I did. Uh, somehow I regret it, though, because okay. it wasn't very good, if I'm honest. Uh, well, uh, what was it that you didn't like about it? Because I never actually read the whole book. You'd think I would, but I never, I never have. Uh, I was about to give up several times. It's just the way he writes, yeah. basically. But it was really cool to read it anyway. I'm happy now because there were certain elements in that we could use in the lyrics, actually. And, and it's great because it's a location that we can use in the video. Yes. You know, I mean, look at this. I mean, they're okay. There's a lot of pros and cons with filming in the Sahara Desert. <laughs> yes. Well, why don't you tell them about some of the pros and some of the cons? Oh, top pro is, well, first time here for me, it's an amazing place to be. I've never been here before. It's, I mean, look at just, it's, okay, the thing is, it's really peaceful and it's really zen and it's really open and expansive. But after you've been here for like two hours, you realize that even if I had all the water I wanted, if I was here for a day, I'd die. Yeah. I mean, it is it is deadly. And it peaceful. can become really brutal that fast. It's when the wind starts to blow, man. It, because the sand, when we were shooting the, well, the musical part of the video, and I'm singing, I always sing uh, along to the track because if I just basically move my mouth, it doesn't look very good. So right. I'm actually singing along. And once the wind starts blowing, you get sand. So I think I've swallowed about three cups of sand last night. Yeah, but you look great. Oh, thanks, man. I can see myself in your glasses. I'm thinking I look great. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that they didn't, they cast me, friends and all, as Lawrence of Arabia, but the Peter O'Toole version from the iconic movie. I do have that softer voice. I, I always seem insubordinate, sir. Yeah. You killed him. He was my friend. Now, if you look over there, you can see a green thing. That is the oasis where the where the resort and hotel is that we're staying. We're staying in the tents. Yep. But tents. they're tents that have toilets and showers and I scorpions, have two spiders, <laughs> not making that up. Cockroaches. <laughs> yeah. What else have like, we seen? Uh, wild camels, but not in the tents. Yeah, yeah, not in the tents, unfortunately. However, we only have air conditioning between seven in the evening and seven in the morning. And uh, I did mention that we're in the Sahara Desert. So it's fairly warm. Yeah, and imagine how great it is to get up 4.30 in the morning, go and have breakfast. It is actually quite great. And then you drive out here for the first time, which is also great. It's great. And then you should do your first shoots here, and it's great. And then it's 9 o'clock, Yeah. and you want a nap, Yeah. and you go back to the tent, and it's 50 degrees in the tent. Uh, that's Celsius, by the way. Yeah, and so, not so great. Yeah, and then you say, oh, the air conditioning is not working, and they go, no, only 7 to 7. And I'm like, <laughs> Can can it be these seven to seven? Because <laughs> they, they run them two a day here in Tunisia. Yeah. yeah. So. This was, I, I've said it to you guys before, when we when we first got to listen to the album, you know, even before you released it, this was my favorite song on the album. Thank and that much. hasn't actually changed. Uh, so. It's still mine as well, actually. Okay. Uh, it's got that old school, you know, like 80s hard rock heavy metal vibe to it. Too. This was actually Astrid's favorite song on the album when oh, she really? first listened to it too. Okay, uh, we are obviously not in Tunisia now, and it's because after we filmed what you just saw, there were some other events that happened on our trip. Yes, a little bit of a surprise on the way we're back. Well, take it away. Well, as some of you might know, we were in a car crash. Uh, we are all going to recover, though. We're still uh, suffering a bit from cracked ribs and... Uh, 
I think Pat got a crack in his neck or something like that. Yeah. And uh, I had some stitches in my face, seven stitches. So seven stitches of wisdom. Wow. Ooh, seven stitches of wisdom. Yeah, now, I, I was not with them in the car because I was still filming. I had another day of filming on Camelback. In the it salt was, flats, right? In the salt flats. Oh. And it was my third day on Camel. And by that day, I thought I was pretty good at riding <laughs> Camel. I mean, the first, you know, riding is okay when they're leading you around. But by then, I could guide it around. Uh, and I got to admit, I really enjoyed riding a camel. That's the thing I liked most about the entire trip was learning how to, you know, get decent at riding a camel. Was it like you expected? No. Um, I, everybody said, okay, it's going to be a different motion. And I knew that, but you could sort of get into a, it's, it's, <laughs> especially when you're going faster. Although, uh, in the salt flats, because, um, you know, the, the, there's mud and stuff under the hard top. And every now and then my camel, his leg would break through and then we'd have, we'd be stuck. We'd have to be stuck until somebody could come and get him out. And they were doing a, a long shot at one point. So I'm like, you know, two kilometers away from any human being dressed as Lawrence of Arabia in the Sahara Desert on a camel wondering how, how did life end up like this when I was a little boy. And I'm guiding my camel and in my pocket of my robes, I've got a walkie talkie so I can hear them tell me if they want me to go left, want me to go right. So I'm going, I'm leading the camel, you know, camel left and stuff. But then after a while, the camel decided he just didn't want to go anymore. Well, I knew how to with the legs and stuff and that had worked before, but nope, this time it didn't work. And I could hear them in the walkie talkie. They're like, no, no, don't stop. Don't stop. Keep going. I'm like, I'm trying to talk and push the button, but, but since they're filming, I'm like, it doesn't want to go anymore. I can't make him go. And then the camel sat down. So, so I got off the camel. And this is a cool thing you can do about cam with camels that you can't really do with horses. I got off the camel. I sat down in the sand, leaned against the camel, and just waited for them to come out. Just me and my camel just hanging out there in the desert. So that's what I did while you guys were having a car wreck. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, whatever, for better or for worse. And there were good things and bad things about the trip, obviously. It was absolutely an adventure. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. I mean, could have been without the car crash, but yeah. truly an adventure. Uh, okay. Well, that is all for today from Sabaton History. Take care and see you soon. Hello there. It's hot. You should become a patron so I can afford to go home.